Hello and welcome everyone to Golden Thread's first sessions, first event of No Summary. This uh, is a live stream series uh, of conversations with artists that don't fit in a box. Um, no Summary essentially means our um, identities and our work uh, are too complicated to, <laughs> to fit in one box. And I'm really delighted uh, to begin this session with Nakama Samini. I will just take a moment to say for those who don't know, Golden Thread is the first uh, American theater company focused on the Middle East. We are based in San Francisco uh, and um, uh, we are now obviously sheltering in place and because of uh, COVID-19, we are producing uh, these uh, digital programming, which we actually hope to continue um, onward. So uh, I'm delighted to welcome Nagma Samini, Iranian playwright, to be our first guest for No Summary. Uh, Nagma John, how are you? Hi, hi Toran John. Hi everybody, I'm so happy that I'm here and um, I'm ready to uh, discuss you about all the background of the play and everything. And I'm so happy that you made this fantastic production of my play. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of you and your group that uh, you just tried to fight with Krona <laughs> in, in a very, many, very, very unusual way, because I remember that uh, we had this plan to um, produce this play uh, for the stage, but uh, because of the corona, we couldn't do that. So I think you did great job and I really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. And just to provide some background to, uh, to our audience, uh, Nagme is referring to the radio play of uh, The Language of Wild Berries, which is uh, a play of hers, or one of the most recent plays uh, that Golden Thread was originally uh, planning to stage this fall. Uh, and because we weren't able to do that, we uh, produced it as a radio play, and we'll talk more about that. But um, let's begin with uh, you and your background, Nagmajan. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your childhood and how you began uh, your theater work. Sure, Toranjan. Actually, I was born in Iran. I was born in Tehran. Uh, I think it doesn't need to mention the year, <laughs> <laughs> but it's easy to find it. It's um, actually 1973. And then uh, I, uh, I just completed all my um, education process in Iran. I got my BA in drama and MA in cinema, both from University of Tehran. And then I got my PhD from another university, again, in, from, I mean, a university in Tehran in um, mythology and uh, drama. Uh, I mean, Mytho mythology. Exactly, mythology and the drama. So uh, then um, it's about um, like, uh, yeah, after, afterward, after getting my PhD, I seriously and professionally started to work in both theater and cinema, but my main focus was in theater, writing for theater. Right. Yeah, I think it's interesting because so many people are not aware that there's actually professional theater exists in Iran and uh, how active it is and also how active women artists are in Iran. Can you tell us a little bit about that, about uh, how you create uh, a theater production in Tehran? What is that process like? Okay, so actually it's like all over the world. Um, um, yeah, I, I also have heard from many of uh, my non-Iranian friends that they have no idea about how theater uh, go, goes on in Iran. But I have to say that it's very powerful and very, uh, I mean, um, serious uh, media in Iran. And just as an example, just um, I want the audience 
know that uh, every night, I mean, actually in pre-corona period, every night you could find over 100 performances in, in a city like Tehran. So it, it, it means that theater is a very live art in a city like Tehran. So I, I know that even in the city now I am in like Seattle, you never can find 100 performances every night to choose in between. So the process of making theater is just like um, all over the world. First, uh, you need to find the text. So, I mean, the first step is uh, producing the text and then a director and producer with together find the text and try to make it produce for the stage. Uh, and uh, I think it's as, I mean, when I was trying to get familiar with what happened in United States, for example, when I started to work with you and your company, I understood that there is no big difference in between the process of producing theater or a play in Iran and in United States and uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, so as a playwright, uh, let's say you finish a play, and then what do you do with it afterwards? Do you immediately publish it? Do you go to a director and say, hey, I want you to read this? Or do you go to theater companies? Like, what is that process like? OK, so um, I, I just explained my own experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure that the other playwrights experience should be or maybe different. Mm -hmm. But mine is that I used to work with some some uh, directors through years. So there are like four or five directors that I can trust them and I, I used right. to work with them. So mm -hmm. they always ask me about a new play and I always, uh, I'm thinking about them. And when I write a play, I, I always think about, okay, this one is fit uh, him or her. So, um, so for me as a playwright who, has this like 20 years um, career behind. Now I, I know some directors who are interested in my works and who I can trust them. So it's not very difficult to find uh, directors. And sometimes mm -hmm. some producers and some unfamiliar companies just call me to ask about my new work to make them produced. So I this see. is, this is my experience, but I know that this is not as easy for young playwrights. That would be much more difficult for them to find their own director and, the, and let their play produce. But anyway, mm -hmm. this is the process. It takes year to, uh, it takes years actually to find your uh, matching producers and um, companies and directors. Yeah, to, to build relationships with uh, artistic collaborators that you trust, who exactly. know your work yeah. and, and exactly. uh, are, are eager to produce your work. Exactly, exactly. Um, I know I'm one of them. So uh, <laughs> uh, be, um, I also wanted to ask a little bit more in detail. I know that, for example, something that's different in Iran is that uh, before a play can be produced or published, it needs to go through a, an approval process. Can you talk about that for us a little bit? Okay, yeah, that is uh, something I know that uh, if that is something very unusual for people who are working in theater in uh, any country but Iran. So yes, that play should be um, read by some kinds of censors and that they uh, give you your own ideas and you have to uh, you have to think about the ideas and maybe change some part of the play but uh, the point is that Iran is a very complicated country and you never can follow anything in Iran just with one formula so yeah that I mean in a very, very surface of this um, story, uh, there are some censors and some writers and they give their own ideas and we need to change. But it's not true. I mean, we get censors ideas and we 
try to change it in the way that we want to make them happy and at the same time keep our main idea. Mm -hmm. So I can say that um, in, in, in 20 years that I worked in theater, what I remember is a kind of eternal fight in between censors and writers. Mm -hmm. So um, through these years, now we, um, I mean, we, it, it seems that we know how to avoid red lines. Right. Um, we grow up with censorship, but now I think uh, this, this obstacle uh, can be solved by on all creative ideas. That is what happened in cinema, in theater, in painting and everything. And it is why that uh, we mm -hmm. still can work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably worth uh, explaining that in, in Iran, there is a ministry of culture, correct? Um, yeah, that's and true. that there is a, an office of theater or dramatic arts. And within that office of dramatic arts, there is like a censorship committee or a review committee. So these are government employees um, that essentially review the work and then issue, as you said, you know, red line the text and, and issue, um, I, I guess they call it recommendations, but... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but what's surprising, I know when I, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go on. Sorry. I, I just th thought that you are changing the point. Okay. No, no, no. The I just subject. wanted to say that knowing that um, one might expect a very sterile theater, a theater that doesn't discuss social issues or political topics. And that is actually not the case in Iran. I can say that I, when I saw theater in Tehran, I was blown away by how, um, I don't even want to say brave because that seems small, but how directly artists tackled political and social issues um, and talked about topics from you know, political uh, reform or where is my vote to, um, to uh, social issues like addiction and homelessness. And, um, and uh, I mean, it was everywhere. And I think that's partly maybe why I, I also felt that the theater audience in Tehran at least was so invested in the performance, right? So once you, you know, you, you watch a performance, the, the theater is packed. There are all kinds of different people in the theater, diverse age groups from the look of it, diverse income levels, uh, you know, some who are more conservatively dressed and some who aren't. Um, so a very mixed audience. And then after the performance, it's like everybody goes to the cafes around the theaters and for hours discusses the content of the play. <laughs> and it just blew me away how invested everyone seemed in uh, whatever the themes were that were discussed in the play. Do you wanna, I mean, has that happened to you? I know in your work, um, you often deal with uh, history, you deal with uh, relationships, um, and it, you know you deal with political issues in very interesting ways, which we'll get to talk about. But have you had that experience where audience members come and you know uh, yeah, discuss actually. the themes of the play with you with passion? <laughs> Toranjan, you are very right. It's unbelievable. I mean, audience, theater audience in Iran uh, is a phenomena, actually. I, I haven't seen something like this anywhere else, actually, because as you rightly mentioned, you can find a diversity of audience, young, old, uh, educated, non-educated, any, any, any kind of people. And when I say that there are uh, or there used to be more than 100 uh, performances on the stage. I'm speaking about full 
full theaters. I'm speaking about, um, I mean, kind of great reception for all these uh, productions. So yeah, that is very, very interesting. And I was, I mean, for years, I was thinking about this phenomena. And uh, the answer I found is that maybe because in Iran, um, somehow theater, the, I mean, watching theater or attending in theater is kind of both entertainment and political slash cultural activity. So I think it reminded me like um, um, old Greek theater, <laughs> which was just like that, both entertainment and uh, cultural, social, even political activity just mm -hmm. intertwined together. Mm -hmm. And people who attend in theater uh, both feel like they are going to be entertained and mm -hmm. at the same time to have a kind of political cultural activity. And it's mm -hmm. why that, as you rightly mentioned, once they, the, the, the play finish and they just uh, leave the theater, they really want to continue what they watched in cafeterias or in or their own home because they feel that they did something mm -hmm. and they really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the uh, misconceptions also about Iranian society is the role of women, right? Um, uh, I, I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that majority of university graduates are women. Is that still the case? 60%. Uh, and so many, um, so many women artists and business owners very active in society, um, very bossy in my experience. <laughs> um, how has your experience as a woman been in, in, in being involved in theater production and also film production? Okay, that's a very good question. If I say that was easy and piece of cake and it was like um, the experience just like uh, the experience of a male writer could have it's not true okay as a woman in a kind of traditional society like Iran that's not um, easy to find your way um, sometimes you need to struggle with so many obstacles from your family to till I mean to the government so there are many obstacles I actually in my own personal experience I was very lucky I grew up in a kind of Middle East educated family and my father was kind of very open-minded person so when I was like 16 and I told him that okay I want to be in theater and I want to do something in theater. And at, at the same, at, at that time, I was not sure that the, whether I want to be an actress or writer or what, but anyway, so he told me that, okay, of course, this is your life and it's your way and I'm proud of you. Okay, do whatever you want. So, and I, I need to say that he was exceptional. Mm -hmm. um, in compare with other the other parents of my friend, I, my other friends that they really wanted their daughters to be a doctor or an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so there was just two <laughs> frames for us. But anyway, mm -hmm. like uh, generally, uh, your um, your idea about uh, women in Iran is very true. Maybe being in cinema or theater for a woman is not easy, but being a doctor or a, being somebody in society, especially in big cities like Tehran, is not difficult. It is something that family push their daughter to have their own education and do something. But mm -hmm. I personally was so lucky. My family really, really encouraged me. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, actually, yes, as a woman, it was not easy to... Uh, make people trust my mind you know mm -hmm. they could accept me as a, as an actress much easier than as a writer that's interesting yeah, yeah because yeah. as an actress they, they need trust me your brain they exactly trust your brain yeah. yeah exactly i mean of course uh, 
I, I, I think that actors should be so wise and smart, and they are, they mostly are. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the point is that for a theater production, you need actresses, but you don't need a female writer. So maybe sometimes you prefer to have a male uh, writer because you can trust to male brain more than female brain. Yeah. But I, I need, I, if I, I, I try to summarize my answer with saying that, okay, my main struggle was to make them trust to a female brain as mm -hmm. a playwright and as a, a script writer. Mm -hmm. And I would venture to say that that's not that different from the US. Oh. <laughs> I think that that may be a global issue that women struggle with. Oh, it's, yeah. it's so tragic, actually. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it means that, okay, but to Angel, I always say to my students that, okay, don't be discouraged because by remembering that it is just about 100 years, more or less, that we started to uh, be in society as writer, as um, social activist, and anything as a woman. So mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a very long way um, in front. Okay, so you sound hopeful. I am hopeful. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I want to just mention that we, the two of us, we met in Iran while I was visiting there and um, I had the good fortune of reading some of your plays in Persian there and I knew um, that I wanted to translate them and hopefully uh, direct them. So <clears throat> uh, last year when I was looking for an Iranian play, to, to include in our 2020 season, you were one of the playwrights that I reached out to. Uh, and we met at a cafe in Seattle while you were in Seattle and, um, and we talked and I said, oh, I'm looking for uh, a play that is about everyday life in Iran. And then you just took out your play and handed it to me. <laughs> uh, and, and I read it, I think that same day and called you and said, yes, this is, this is the play. <laughs> it, was, it was almost magical and miraculous, but it happened so easily. Um, so the play is called The Language of Wild Berries. Um, and Golden Thread Productions has produced it as a radio play. Uh, our audience, I invite you to go to our website. You'll find the link to the podcast. And if you haven't yet, please listen to it. It's a beautiful play. Um, uh, bef it's about a couple, yes? It's about a couple who every year they have a ritual on their anniversary they take the same trip to the same town by the Caspian Sea. Um, and you, you tell us, you tell us the story. How, how do you? Okay, I, uh, I want to tell this story in a way that- um, Doesn't give it away. Just, exactly, uh, because, I, okay, um, that is my question. Can people, um, here to the radio play after this meeting, this reception? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Ho okay. I think, so I think many will, hopefully. Yeah. But great. So I, I want to tell the story in a way not to um, spoil yes. <laughs> you and not to ruin the dramatic point. So as you rightly mentioned, this is about a couple who are going to north of Iran to um, uh, completing their divorce process. So they are on the way of uh, separation. Yeah. And so this is their 10th anniversary and they're exactly. preparing to get a divorce. Exactly, that's true. And somebody is actually um, tracing them. Is that the right word? Tracing uh, or chasing them. or following. following them. Yeah. <laughs> and he is so suspicious. And if at the beginning, it seems that he is going to kill them for some reasons, for some mm -hmm. political reasons or something like that. But um, what, I mean, uh, when play goes further and further, um, something more unusual uh, and mysterious reveals 
through uh, the story. Mm -hmm. So, and at the end, um, there is a very, very, uh, uh, there is a kind of shock, I think, for the audience. I, I really it like the end of the ending of this play. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, it's, a, it's a twist, actually. The, the main twist happens in the end of the play. Mm -hmm. so, I think this is the story. This is the, the main line of the story in the way that people, uh, I mean, it, I, I really tried not to spoil the story. Yes, the audience. yes. you did a good job. Um, <laughs> what was it like to hear the play in English? Oh, <laughs> very interesting, very complicating feeling. You know, uh, as you know, my play been translated to different languages, like Spanish, French, German, and um, recently Italian. And uh, I have heard some of the play readings in different languages of my own play, and I didn't have any feeling uh, because I couldn't emotional understand. Response. Exactly. Emotional response. Yeah, I just was happy that my my child stepped in different culture. Yes. <laughs> it, it was just like that. And I didn't have any um, emotional feeling about what happened because I couldn't understand this. But at this time, especially when I uh, listened to the play you directed, I felt I had so many complicated uh, feelings and I was so emotional. First of all, I felt that no, the play has two writers. <laughs> me and secondly you and I really can I, I need to appreciate your great job for translating this play Thank you. Thank I, you. Uh, you, I know that how you were um, sensitive about each word uh, I know that because you were talking uh, with me for any 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 words and any translations and what you chose for any word but what I felt Firstly, was how um, the play now has two mothers, not just one. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it was something very close to me and at the same time very far. Yes. So it was very interesting, complicated, great, fabulous feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're you're very generous. Thank you. I can I can say that the process of translating this play was first of all a pleasure because it's so well written but obviously as you begin the translation process you you have to make choices and and uh this is such a layered uh play and there are so many hidden meanings so i wanted to <clears throat> i wanted to do justice to the many layers of the play and i think that's where uh, the challenges were and some of the choices had to be made and um, I'm glad to hear that you don't feel like um, any significant meaning was lost. Not at all. No, not at all. No. That's great. Yeah, it's interesting to, um, I do think, you know, as someone who uh, you kind of lives in both languages, both in Persian and in English, um, it, it is it is a different story, right? It's the same story, but in a way, uh, it lives differently depending on the language. So that's an interesting that's an interesting um, experience, I think, to to hear it. So now I can't wait to see a production in Persian. <laughs> It'll be sure. fun. <clears throat> so talk a little bit about the themes of the play. I know language speaking of translation and the power of language, I know language is a major theme mm -hmm. in the play. Talk a little bit about, uh, and your own background, obviously, in mythology, you kind, you've kind of centered the myth of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of languages. Uh, it, it plays a central role in, in the play and uh, one character, is working on his PhD on ancient languages. The other character teaches English in Tehran. So talk a little bit about why language plays, why did you, why were you drawn to making it such a big part of this play? Um, actually, Toranjan, um, 
as you said, there are so many different layers in the play. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually, and for me, as the writer of this play, uh, maybe it's not very easy to talk about all these layers and all these themes. And I think that maybe audience can find even more ideas in the play that I ever thought about. So, mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, when I was thinking about that play and when I was in the process of writing the play, the first thing I was thinking was that how a generation um, lose uh, the language and the communication mm -hmm. in in personal way and in political, I mean, situation, both of them. Mm -hmm. So then let me tell you that uh, I tried, uh, I mean, my, my, main, uh, my main challenge in this play was to um, show how personal personal problem or personal matters related to um, political condition and mythological background. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, as, as a person from Iran, this is my own experience that how in a, every single moment, my personal um, issues are intertwined with political Mm -hmm. uh, situation of my country mm -hmm. and at the same time with the mythological background because as you know mm -hmm. Iran has a very long long history and yes. very I mean rich uh, mythological source mm -hmm. so it it seems that we are in between these two you know mm -hmm. two points from from our back backside we are related to a mythological and historical background and in, 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 I mean, and from other side we are very related to a political situation of our country so mm -hmm. in a country like Iran anything is political I have to yeah. mention this anything I mean drinking water is also political anything is political so mm -hmm. in the play I try to find a way to show how this couple and how their own very personal problem uh, intertwined with their uh, history and the politic of the country. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting what you say because I think it really resonates with where the US is today, mm -hmm. right? We are now experiencing uh, our history, right, our history of slavery and the genocide of indigenous population of this country catching up with us and uh, we are forced to face, face it and, and it is impacting our daily lives. So these issues of social justice, whether they are on a national level or a personal level, are, like you say, intertwined, particularly for uh, the Black population, the Latino population, but also for all of us immigrants in the US, we've become politicized. Our lives are now politicized, right? So our personal choices have political ramification and political meaning, um, which is, you know, what you're describing and I think what, what happens in, the, in your play, The Language of Wild Berries. Um, similarly, the, the issue of divorce, the way you tackle it in the play, right? It's a very personal experience, right? Yeah, but then, yeah. but then you, you give us this very, uh, very thoughtful, profound political analysis of divorce. And I think it, it, um, it goes uh, in parallel with language, you know, like uh, how language, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, talk about, talk about divorce from a, per, you know, from a personal issue to, to a political issue. Yeah, actually, um, I, I, um, I got this idea from my own life, let's mm -hmm. confess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because, um, okay, let's say uh, when I wrote the first draft, it mm -hmm. was before I uh, get my divorce. I mean, 
yeah so like um, five years ago when I wrote the or maybe six years ago when I wrote the first draft it was before my divorce and I didn't like the play at all I knew that uh, something missing in the play something is not real I didn't have this experience so afterward after um, tragically I got my divorce then I uh, came back to the play and I tried to rewrite it and I found lots of things in the play that I missed in the first draft and I got all of them from my own experience for example there, there is a line in a play that you perfectly translated it and so it's why that I wrote the, the, the uh, line because I don't want to ruin your translation by my <laughs> own so it is something like you sleeping in a highway and memories drive over you the speed of 120 so that that is exactly why what I experienced after my divorce I really felt that all the memories are drawing over me in a very speedy way so yes so that is my personal life and at the same time I was experienced I was experiencing green movement in Iran mm -hmm. which was a very um, I mean effective movement it didn't affect on um, government directly mm -hmm. but it affected every single uh, moment of our life afterward seriously mm -hmm. yeah, so you mean you mean it impacted it, it changed exactly yeah mm -hmm. that is true so actually i uh, when, when i was when i was rewriting the play i tried to get uh, ideas from these two different sources the one was very personal which was my divorce my own mm -hmm. divorce and the other one was so a general political source, which was green movement and what happened mm -hmm. at that time in uh, my country. Yeah, it's there is a speech in the in the play, um, and will we'll, uh, that really opens that up and and um, in a way presents us with a thesis uh, of. Um, how uh, a large social or political movement uh, impacts personal lives. Uh, with that note, I wanna actually open up the conversation to our um, actors. I think we are joined by Abraham Makani, who played the part of Davud in the language of wild berries and Sal Matos, who played the part of Danielle, hi, welcome, both of you. Um, and uh, Mona, you're, do you want to join us? Mona Castra, who is, um, who is part of the pr uh, production, the original production as projection designer, but she definitely stayed on and supported the process for the radio play. So welcome to all of you. Um, I want to open it up to your questions for Narmé. Um, sorry, I turned off my phone, my microphone. I thought that, okay, <laughs> it's finished with me. <laughs> You're not done. Not, 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 not done. yet. Well, actually, let me, <laughs> Sal and uh, Abe and Mona, let me, let's give Narmé a, a quick break. Um, let me ask you, what was the experience of being a part of this uh, radio play? What was that experience for you in terms of uh, being a part of this play, you know, um, playing the part of Iranians or uh, being in that environment? What was that like? Abe, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it was awesome, you know, I, uh, I really loved the piece. Um, I, you know, was lucky enough to, you know, know you from, you know, working in the Bay Area before at uh, Marin Theater Company doing Nura with mm -hmm. Denmo, who was the other uh, lead in this piece. And I mean, you know, obviously, I, I definitely wanted to do it live. You know, mm -hmm. that would have been amazing. But the fact that we that you all were able to to you know create this scenario where we could do it from from anywhere in the country uh i mean they sent us mics and the headset and 
we recorded it, you know, on Zoom essentially and, and another platform. And it was, uh, I mean, it was awesome to, to experience it in a, a different way, you know, where we really had to listen to each other, you know, only from our voices and not really see each other and feel each other. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the piece is like a, a dream, like, you know, I don't know. It's like a, it just felt like a dream, but it really encompasses what I feel it is to be in a, in a couple, you know, you, you, you go through these ups and downs and it's really beautifully put together. So yeah, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Sal. Yeah. Um, if the play is beautiful. I remember when I first read it before auditioning um, and just imagining, you know, what it would be like um, to sort of see it uh, on stage and, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully one day um, we can make that happen. And uh, the thing that was interesting for me was um, playing Danielle, again, not to try to avoid spoilers, but Danielle kind of exists in this very, the whole play is kind of in this going back and forth between memory and uh, um, and uh, and the uh, and the present, and Danielle kind of um, kind of breaks the rules, and he kind of addresses the audience, and he kind of exists in his own sort of reality sometimes. And so that was kind of actually interesting to play f remotely, because there were times where um, there is that distance between the characters, even though on stage he's right there with them, he's not seen, or he's you know he, there's something sort of magical and theatery about it. Um, so that was kind of interesting playing from afar and trying to find those moments of connection, um, like Abe was mentioning, and then uh, being able to kind of relish in those moments of disconnection as Danielle. Um, it actually kind of benefited, I think, the character a little bit um, in, in this sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mona, how about you? You're Iranian. Absolutely. What was it like Absolutely. to... <laughs> Yeah, for me, this, uh, I, from the beginning, when we started um, talking to Tara, and which seems like it was age ago, right before pandemic and all of that, and we were so excited to stage this piece. I left Iran like about a couple of decades ago, but like the road that this uh, play takes place, the, the, it's just, it brings up a lot of memories. And also I love the context of this really winding road and this notion of memory and the challenges that this couple is going through socially and also personally. The play with public privates that they, you know, what what they do, what they talk about together. So it just, it, it really resonated so much. And I love Nagma's work. Um, she definitely thinks also very visually, I think. And I was so excited about um, yeah. making this happen, like bringing this, staging this, and, um, you know, be able to just really uh, share this beautiful piece with the American participants or outside Iran. Um, but the pandemic happened, <laughs> and, you know, we were trying to really make it happen. And uh, but I'm so glad the radio play um, went along. It's really beautifully it captures, I think, the emotions and the meaning so well. I still remain remain helpful that we're gonna at some point our end is gonna do this <laughs> once yeah. things are back in normal. But it was just an amazing experience just being part of the group and just talking to everyone. Um, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, script. Do do you have any questions for Nagme at all? Um, I, I, I feel like we, since we had that longer conversation there, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if Nagra, you think of this also as a film. Do you see this becoming like an actual, like a screenplay at some point? I had, I had actually thought that as well when I was reading it, that it would yeah. make a beautiful film as well as a play. Okay, so the good news is that um, a friend of mine who is a filmmaker and who lives in California, uh, but now she's in uh, Syracuse University, maybe you have heard about her, Suda Bemuradian, uh, yeah. she is uh, working on this uh, play to make it a um, script. I mean, we are working with together actually. But at the beginning, Mona, that is really interesting point that you mentioned. I have heard, I actually, at that time, I had heard a lot about road movies, but not uh, play, I mean, road, uh, road theater or road play. <laughs> so, uh, but, but at that time, I was thinking that how I can um, just make a new way 
to show that we in, in theater, we also can have a kind of road journey to show how character react to this, um, I mean, to uh, this uh, new situation out of their home. My, my, my plays before writing uh, this, um, the language of wild berries, um, they happen mostly in, in, a, in a private uh, kind of home, homey place. But it was the first time I tried to uh, write something outside of the home. Mm -hmm. And you know, as the, the, the title of the play uh, shows, I was very under the inspiration of the movie by um, uh, Ingemar Bergman called um, Wild Strawberries. So um, yeah, actually at the beginning I was thinking about cinema, but um, in, in, a, in a opposite way. How I can bring, how I can borrow something from cinema for the theater. We mm -hmm. always do the, um, I mean, do the opposite way, borrowing from theater to cinema. But now I thought That's I tried so to do something different. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah. It, it just uh, and and the thinking, the visual thinking of you know the way the environments they're in and the way you talk about that. I just I, I just find that really wonderful. Thank and you. I have to say, Torrance did such a beautiful job translating this because I thank read you, the Farsi you. script first. And then when I read the uh, translation, it was like really captured the context. And sometimes our words mean different in Farsi and what we were trying to say. And you really captured it, Torrance. I don't know how hard that must have been. I'm sure it's not easy. Uh, it was a pleasure, I have to say. Translation is uh, such a it's it's like you go on a journey you you know i mean i'm a playwright also so it i really respect the word of the playwright i really understand that nothing is accidental in a play and so i i try to dig deeper and deeper to understand um tone, repetition, you know, all of these choices because they're not, um, you know, they're not accidental. Um, something that you mentioned, Nazme, reminded me that I've read two of your other plays and you're right that they both happen in a house. The characters do not leave. Um, yeah. and, and it's interesting just uh, to look at your own work and it's, is it, does it feel like with the language of wild berries, you've left home? <laughs> does it? Because now you're like on the road, right? Yeah, maybe it's why, because I wrote the play in Seattle and at that time I didn't feel Seattle as, as my home, <laughs> you know, so that was the first time I wrote, I completed a play outside of Iran and outside of my own home, but that is true. Uh, my very recent play, I am rewriting this play, is uh, it, again, it is not happened in a home. It's outside of the home and it's somewhere very mysterious. I'm not going to talk about that, but that is true. I, I you know, for me, home is, uh, home is part of our identity. And I wanted to put this couple out of their regular identity. So that is what I trying to do with putting them out of, of their own, um, in, you know, your, how do you call it? Immune zone or uh, safe zone? Safe, safe zone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I really wanted to put them out of, out of their own safe zone to see how they uh, react and how their behavior change. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I think there is, we do behave differently inside the house as opposed to outside, right? That's, that is a thing. And, and, and I, I just, as an observer, I find it interesting uh, that while you were mainly living in Iran, your place took place inside the house. And now that you've become more of an immigrant, exactly. they're yeah. happening outside the house. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's true. So I, when, I mean, when I write an article analyzing your career, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that. That's great, that's so dead on. <laughs> please do, please do. Yeah. I would love to read that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, um, actually, Toranjan, I am very amateur immigrant. I'm very amateur immigrant, I have to say. <laughs> it's just about one year and a half, I really decided to come out from the country. But I need to say that for us, as a people who uh, immigrate from our own route and our own country, home is a very big issue, I think. Home is a, I mean, we, all, we always have this question that where is our home? Where is our home? And uh, so even when you uh, write a play outside of the home, still you are thinking about home. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think it's interesting because when I'm, uh, yeah, it's th th like belonging, home and belonging. These are, these are the constant um, topics that we tackle as, um, as immigrants. Uh, one of our audience members um, has asked a question about dramaturgy. Uh, I know that for the radio play, we did some dramaturgy and Mona, you supported this process also. Do you want to talk a little bit about your presentation? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are so many contextual uh, aspects to the play that we were trying to, and also like if your audience is, I think, Iranian, perhaps they would have certain understandings of you know, the location even that this happens or what this road to the north of Iran mean or how does that work? Uh, what the green movements, like that's such a signifier for um, the newer generations, especially back in Iran. So like, how do you translate that or how do you give that context? And, you know, I, I, I'm a visual person. So I just try to create this, a bundle of giving context visually then how does it, living in Tehran even mean? Because uh, a lot of our understanding, especially outside, um, like from the West um, is the news media and how we think of certain countries in a particular way. Um, so we, we hope that like, I guess that those images or that kind of dramat dramaturgy uh, called visual dramaturgy, just helps giving those type of context a little bit more connection with what is happening really in the play and what mm -hmm. is this couple talking about really. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is interesting in terms of producing or directing um, and you know a radio play or working only with audio right like the only source of communication is audio so it's an interesting challenge to how much can you convey with audio? And, you know, we had a brilliant um, uh, sound designer, James Ard, who introduced so many layers of sound and really helped build the, the various moments and the various environments. But even in terms of working with actors, you know, how uh, it was a challenge for me, and I'm curious, Abe and Sal, uh, how you felt, but there were times that um, I felt like I was pushing you to uh, exaggerate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because I felt like otherwise it wouldn't, the moment wouldn't come across. How, how did it feel for you? I mean, I got to say, those those moments were difficult for sure because mm -hmm. uh you know you you have the vision as the director but for us over here and we kind of have an idea you know since we're not able to really be there in the room with each other it's kind of hard to to really see the moment the way you know that it's gonna like after after hearing it you kind of you kind of realize wow i didn't even know that moment was going to be like that quick or that that sound was going to affect this moment in a way that, you know, we didn't when we were, you know, recording it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just, I mean, I trusted you, though. I knew that it was going to, you know, be something beautiful. But in the moment, you can't really see it because, you know, mm -hmm. we didn't have as much time to really delve into the work like we would if we were in the rehearsal process for a play. Mm -hmm. um, so it was much more like a film in that way where, Sometimes you, you get a director that's able to kind of give you, you know, the leeway to, to really delve into the role. And sometimes you just show up and are expected mm -hmm. to create, you know, an Oscar award winning moment. So, <laughs> so um, 
so it was difficult, but you know, that's, that's the, the beautiful challenge of, of these times and, and, you know, this art form. So I, I enjoyed it either way. Yeah. How about you, Sal? Yeah. Um, it was, uh, it was definitely challenging in the sense that uh, same, I like to get in the room. I like to, you know, feel the vibe of the energy and the stage and, you know, what you're wearing, how you're move. I'm a very like movement. I like to move around. Mm -hmm. And so, which I'm sure you guys saw when we were recording, sometimes my hands would just be like going all yes. over the place while I was talking. Um, and then just remembering like those things that I would sometimes use to convey emotion, uh, emotion, whether it's my eyes, whether it's my hands, those aren't going to be on the other side of what the audience in this version are going to see or hear. Um, and so uh, it was actually really interesting listening to uh, listening to the play yesterday. Um, and uh, I, I think the emotions came through, but I do think there were those times where you were like, just take it, like, be really, really happy. Just like be as happy <laughs> as possible when you deliver this monologue. And I, you know, and I felt like I was going up, like over the top with like yeah. uh, over inflecting. But then when I hear it, I'm like, oh no, it actually, in terms of just the audio, it got mm. it got us where we needed to go but of course in the moment I felt like I feel like a clown you know like yeah. laughing and like doing too much and but I think it ended up working and yeah I have to second the shout out to James the some of the audio things especially for uh Danielle's uh yeah I have a bunch of monologues and there were these kind of mysterious musical scores and sound effects that were coming in and out and yeah. it really like transported the piece in a way that that I I like I was I was surprised by like I was thinking I'm gonna hear the same thing that I've been hearing for every day that we recorded and it I even for my own parts I felt like I was transported so it was really cool to see how those things can can kind of like add to the magic. Yeah, we should we should mention that that original music is composed by Mohammad Talani, uh, who's one of our local. Uh, musicians and composers here in the Bay Area and a Golden Thread resident artist. So we're very proud uh, of his work. It's really beautiful work. Yeah. It beautiful and it's, work. Uh, it's based on an idea, Nagme, that you gave. Remember, you, we talked about music and you said, what if we take uh, the traditional wedding song of Bada Bada Mubarak Bada and create these other variations. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, actually I was, uh, when I first uh, listened to the radio play, I was so surprised uh, how he used this uh, theme and this motif as the main, main idea of the music. And I really love this, especially, you know, at the beginning we hear something based on this theme and at the ending, you can hear the whole song in the background. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like the, the, this way. I, I think there is kind of, a, um, uh, okay, uh, my, my piano teacher years ago told me that actually this music is very, very sad one. It's for celebration of marriage. But if you try to sing it slowly, you feel that's how, how that you feel that how sad it is. Listen. You see how sad is this? It's very bluesy. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> so how it can be a, the song of a, the, uh, the song of the celebration of marriage. So yeah. it's why that I gave you this idea. And I think you um, and uh, he as the musician use this much better than what I told. It's, it's all his. Yeah, I, I, I just gave him that idea and he said, oh, interesting. And then two weeks later, you know, he gave us this amazing compositions. And we actually just used the fraction of what he has composed. So I'm yeah. hoping that he will, you know, one day issue an album just on variations of what I thought it would be really interesting. Um, Nagma, what is, um, because you've worked both in cinema and theater uh, in Iran, what is the, how is it different? Uh, are you as involved in the production of cinema um, or do you, do you stay away? 
And Toranjan, can you uh, can can I ask you to ask the question again because there was something happened in my oh, internet. Sure. Yeah, so, um, so, just curious yeah. about the difference between uh, working on a cinema production and theater, um, and how involved you are. Uh, I'm assuming with a theater production, you stay pretty involved. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Actually, there is a huge difference. Um, as a playwright, I feel um, very powerful in the process of the production. You on know, I feel mm -hmm. exactly in a theater play, exactly. But in cinema, I feel that I'm the second person, not the first person, you know? So, yeah, uh, because, you know, you never are as involved as uh, practitioners, as a playwright. Uh, when you are working in cinema, you know, um, they, I mean, I always give my script to the, um, to the people who are working on that uh, movie or series. And then um, afterward, like a, a year later, I can see the result. So mm -hmm. actually I'm not, uh, I literally, I am not involved with the process of uh, filming my script, mm -hmm. but uh, in 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 the in the process of uh, producing a play, I'm always one of the uh, first references. So mm -hmm. um, actually, that is much more joyful. Sometimes it's much more joyful. Which one? Writing for a theater, of course, uh, mm -hmm. because you know this is a this is um, I feel more more as a writer than when I write for cinema or for series. Mm -hmm. I feel more, I, I, I more identify myself as a writer when I write for theater rather than cinema or series. Mm -hmm. But actually, mm -hmm. I mean, that is completely different file. I also love to write for them. And sometimes I really need, um, I actually economically, I <laughs> very depend <laughs> on that. <laughs> yes. You see, yes. and I really, I, I sometimes I really try to, uh, um, inspire myself by my own experiences in theater to write for cinema and series. So mm -hmm. um, theater always been the main source of my inspiration. So, um, uh, okay, that is, that is <laughs> the answer. <laughs> we, sh we should mention that you are the writer of one of the most popular TV series in Iran, Shahzad. Will you tell us a little bit about that TV series? Yeah, actually, that was uh, super popular, um, both for Iranians who uh, live in Iran and people who, Iranians who doesn't live in Iran and who live in the United States, for example. So I uh, started to write that series like um, maybe five, six years ago. And uh, actually, Shahza changed my life <laughs> because, yeah, yeah, because before, and writing Shahzad, I was mostly um, actually known um, as a playwright and not a scriptwriter. And then afterward, I suddenly uh, was known as a, a series writer and I got super famous. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a very unusual experience for me. I mean, I let let tell you something funny about my experience in Iran when I was in Iran. Uh, before writing the Shahzad, I just like other people uh, uh, need to stay behind any line, line for getting visa and embassy or anything. I mean, some other other lines. But after writing Shahzad, I had this experience that I was known. So people came to me to say, oh, you are the writer of Shahzad? Please don't stay in the line. You can come, uh, <laughs> you can skip the line. So wow. it was, yeah, yeah. But it was, I mean, yeah, writing, actually writing Shahzad was a great experience for me to know how we can talk to a majority of people mm what I think and uh, not easy to do with theater. Mm -hmm. So theater is kind of the source of art, the source of experience. And for me, writing a series beside the, uh, you know, economical uh, issues is a way to talk 
with so many people at the, the masses, same time. Yeah. And I think it was, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Talk to masses and it was so precious for me. I have a uh, question. You... Oh, go uh, ahead. I'm sorry for, for not my uh -huh. um, With this, this piece, you know, I, I guess in my view of, of the Iranian like censor, you know, that they have in Iran, um, how did you kind of, get, I don't want to say get away. I, I feel like there's a fine line maybe with the work. I don't want, without giving too much away. Um, but, you know, certain political aspects of it and maybe, you know, the things that go on in a relationship, you know, are touched uh, upon in this piece. And in, in, in my mindset as an Iranian American, uh, you know, you have this idea that the Iranian, you know, government doesn't want to portray themselves in that way or even touch upon, you know, things that are talked about in, in this piece. So how did you, how did you manage that? Um, uh, I'm not sure that I could understand your question. Can I ask you okay. to explain a little bit more about that? Let, let, okay. let me explain that. Sure. It's, it's the same question we talked about before that there are things in the play that are that seem overtly political or even the intimate relationship of a couple that are in the play that one would not expect would be allowed in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Iran. So mm -hmm. how did you manage, manage it? Okay, so um, first uh, let me give you a general answer and that I forget to uh, say when I was, uh, when we were talking about censorship. Actually, um, there are two important points about censorship in theater in Iran. First one is that uh, censor, I mean, it is different from censor to censor how to censor a text. <laughs> Does it make sense, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It really, I mean, there is no law. There is no law. You never have one red line that you know that. Red lines are so floating. They're so very subjective. Based it's on very who's, subjective. Based exactly. on who's reviewing. It's, it's, that's very true. That's very true. So, I, I mean, um, it has um, some, um, it, it, it's good somehow because you can do whatever you want and then tell that, okay, I didn't know that it is something I didn't, uh, I, I, I wasn't allowed to write, for example. But um, the downside is that, uh, okay, you never know where you are, uh, behind the red line or the other side of the red line. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, so sensors are different. That is the first point. And the other point is that, okay, the censorship, um, how can I say, the censorship uh, apply uh, the censorship applies for cinema uh, and for TV series. It, it, it's, it is very different from what happened in theater. Mm. Um, in theater, it's much lighter, I have to say. They're much more lenient. In it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's uncomparable. You, you can't compare the censorship in, for example, TV and what happened in theater. So for us as uh, playwrights, it's much easier to write what we think and what we uh, want to express. But in, the, in this single play, uh, The Language of Wild Berries, I knew that I will have some challenges with censorship because I was writing about um, something like green movement and uh, those political situation of Iran. But fortunately, I didn't uh, face any, any serious uh, censor in Iran. I, I hope um, not after this conversation. <laughs> you right. know, I need to be a little bit careful and right, I need right. to make a good choice of my words and not to be in danger after <laughs> this conversation, but it's joking. But you know, because you know, most of the censors got this play as a family play, you know? And I think they kindly <laughs> tried uh, to skip those political layers of the play. So I could, I could publish the play and I could make the play uh, staged uh, for over one month. 
and uh, just some besides some some lines I didn't change anything when I was working on this play and mm -hmm. I think partly it was because when I was writing the play I knew that how I can avoid the red lines mm -hmm. not to be in danger mm -hmm. gotcha. okay. I remember <clears throat> one of the playwrights uh, told me a story about censorship that uh, the censors had an issue with a particular play with a particular ward that he used in his play. I don't know, let's say elevator as an example. And they asked him to change that word. And so uh, he changed it to, to a number, to like number four. So wherever the word elevator showed up in the play, he changed it to the number four and then it was published that way. So like there's no logic or uh, attempt at meaning or anything like that. It's a little arbitrary is my understanding. The Toranjan, the funny thing is that I know that that playwright. Uh, so, and I know the trick he applied uh, in his plays. But the interesting thing is that if I remember correctly, uh, after years, number four was in the list of censorship. <laughs> <laughs> they caught on. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody can use the number four. No, five is okay. Uh, three is okay, but no four. Four, four and a half is. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Abe, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. um, can you tell us a little bit about your theater career as an Iranian American? How has it been? Are you often cast as like as a in a Middle, Middle Eastern part or is that rare or how is it? Um, no, I'm, I'm definitely cast as, as Middle Eastern. You know, I think I not Latino. I so I'm yeah, as you as you know, I am a half Latino, half Persian mm -hmm. and I'm fluent in Spanish speak very little Farsi. Father never really taught me. I'm not mad we'll, at him. We'll change that, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the industry, for better or worse, how it has been, has, has seen me as Middle Eastern. And so the plays that I've done and, and you know, the film and TV stuff, I've, I've had stuff where I'm able to, like, you know, play a piece that has nothing to do with that. But generally, I do play mostly Middle Eastern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, you know, who else should tell those stories? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to tell those stories, you know, yeah. especially one like this or, or, you know, like the piece we did at, uh, at Marin theater company. I mean, I think it was a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. So. And that's Noura that play is Narme. If you come across it, it's, it'd be worth seeing Noura by Heather Raffo mm -hmm. is a beautiful play. Um, Abe, do you feel like there are parts that you audition for that you think you would be perfect for, but never get cast? Yeah, like that's 99% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that's, that's the name of the game. It's uh, persistence and, and perseverance over those kind of uh, moments. Yeah. How about you, Sal? What, what has your theater career been like? Yeah, um, it's actually interesting. It's kind of uh, a, a bit of an inversion, I would say, of Abe's in a little, in a lot of ways. Um, I get put in the ethnically ambiguous box, where they're like, "We don't know what you are," and so we kind of just cast you as whatever uh, is is around. Um, but that does tend to mean uh, rarely is it uh, leading uh, parts, um, and uh, it's usually more side characters, which I'm happy to do. I, they're usually more fun. But um, it's funny, I'm, I'm personally am, uh, half Filipino um, and I primarily identify as Filipino and I have not once in my career, I've been acting since I was 15. So in 15 years, I have not once played a character that was explicitly written as a Filipino character, mm -hmm. um, but I have played many roles. So um, it's kind of, you know, I think it just speaks to, you know, what are the stories being told out there Mm -hmm. um and uh you know what where are those opportunities i'm happy to take them i actually i remember you know in the process of casting this wanting to be you know um 
wanting to be conscious of the fact that this is such a culturally specific piece of work, especially after you know getting to read the play before auditioning. And I remember reaching out and saying, you know, is it appropriate for me to audition for this role? And we kind of mm -hmm. had that conversation and mm -hmm. um, about Daniel specifically, given that he um, kind of exists kind of in this weird, uh, he's in reality, he's, he's out of reality. And so there's, um, and I, I felt honored to be a part of it. And I wanted to make sure that uh, with anything that we did and anything that we were exploring to be as reading up as much as I could about, you know, all the material that was provided, all the dramaturgy, mm -hmm. all the historical context so that, you know, I felt uh, that I was, at, you know, doing justice to the culturally specific things um, mm -hmm. that we were, that we were um, exploring. Yeah, you both did a great job. And I, I, I will just say that at Golden Thread, we um, let cultural competency be our guide in casting. Uh, and not so much uh, looks, because I think the politics of casting in the United States, uh, you know, it's funny because we don't think about theater in the U.S. as a, as a political game, but it is a political game, right? Yeah. <clears throat> There's a politics of casting, politics of what gets produced, what stories are told, who gets to tell them, um, and how, uh, how we are represented. And um, and we are, uh, yeah, like I said, you know, for us, it's really about cultural competency and an actor's ability to do justice to the character's experience uh, is how we, um, how we make our selections. Nahme, how I love that word, word Torej, by the way, cultural competency, competency, that term, that term of like cultural uh, competency is so, so great great lens to look at theater as you said what's produced how, who gets to be in it who tell yeah that's great yeah because i mean there are artists who are you know from the culture don't identify as that culture don't know anything about it so i don't really see the point of like casting them in a part that they don't connect with or do justice to you know so yeah. um Nahme, how is casting in, in Iran? Is it difficult or do you have an abundance of talented actors of all kinds? Um, actually, there are many, many talented actors uh, because there are actually many private classes along with uh, f um, theater faculties in Iran. Uh, and you can find many educated, um, actors and actresses come from these um, private institutes or universities, um, faculties, schools. So there are many, many of them and mostly are young. Uh, sometimes it's uh, not easy to choose in between them because there are many and most of them are so talented. Mm -hmm. And as playwrights, do you get involved in casting? Do you have a say or is it the director mainly? Uh, actually, I can give them my suggestion and um, that, I mean, directors always try to listen to me. Uh, sometimes I say that, okay, I wrote this uh, character specifically for this actor, mm. but sometimes, uh, and they, and some, and of course, they really try to find her, her or him and bring uh, her to the uh, product, but um I mean, the other times I just say that, okay, that is the features of the actor or actress mm -hmm. I was thinking when I was writing the play. Ah, uh, the look. You know? So, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually I, I always are, uh, are asked to give some advices about um, the cast. And mm -hmm. that's very, very interesting, very, very important, I think. Mm -hmm. One of the things I noticed in uh, theater production in Tehran was that they rarely hold auditions. Okay. They just go to the actors and invite them to join the production. Yeah, is that, that is, yeah, that is, great. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is very true, but it, it's mostly for professionals. Uh -huh. You know, professional actors uh, never, um, never attend in any audition. Mm. They feel that they don't need this or they, they feel that it's not uh, fair after 
in years working to 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 you know to be chosen okay mm -hmm. so but the, but but um, it, it's not very true about um, young actors who are not very um, famous Oh, yeah, and famous. they were not. They are not uh, famous. I mean, being famous is more important than having experience. It's it's unfair, of course, mm -hmm. but um, that is the reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, nowadays uh, it, it's more. You can find more audition for oh, young. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's more, but it's still not for professionals and not for um, kind of superstar actors. Yeah. Yeah, I made that mistake a couple of times. I asked, uh, you know, a couple of actors who, uh, I don't know, they thought they were above auditioning. I asked them to attend our audition and they were very offended. Exactly. <laughs> I can imagine. That is true. Yeah. And Toranjan, if we have time, I would like to have a, a just very quick uh, question yes, of you. Please. Of course. Why did you choose this this text? <laughs> it's a very general a question. question. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's what I what I said at our you know at that coffee shop in Seattle. Mm -hmm. you know, I was so 2020 is an election year. This administration had been increasingly attacking Iran and vilifying Iran and. I was afraid that Iran was going to become a ploy on the road to the election. And I wanted as our fall production to stage a, an Iranian play that featured everyday, contemporary, accessible, lovable Iranian characters. Um, and, you know, and your play was it. It was, uh, it was about uh, a, an issue, divorce, that everyone can, can um, relate to. Um, and two contemporary, you know, a contemporary couple that is just dealing with marriage challenges. Uh, both of them are interesting and layered and complex. Neither is a terrorist or <laughs> an oppressed silent woman. And, uh, you know, they're both professionals and they have ambitions and they have inner emotional lives. And, you know, it may sound s simple or minimal, but it's a huge thing, right? Because representation, I mean, oh my God, every time Iran is mentioned in the news is in the context of you know, bullying and, and political violence and, uh, and you never, I can't even remember the last time I heard about Iran in a positive way on, on the media. I don't know, have you guys, do you guys remember maybe, uh, what's his name's uh, trip to Iran? Anthony Bourdain's <laughs> trip to Iran. <laughs> when was that? In the nineties, or I don't even know when that was. But that's that was like late two thousands, right? Yeah. Yeah, like that was the last time that I think Iran was represented in any meaningful way. Um, and it's scary. It's scary because people don't know anything about the country, and um, the U.S. is is in a position to really. Um, uh, force violence on Iran, and uh, and it's scary. It's scary to me. Yeah, I, I remember think part of also one of the sorry sorry Abe just uh, like the U.S. Not that we, there there is this lack of understanding or uh, familiarity with the actual context of the country, but also the youth. Most of Iran is like young people, and what they're thinking, what their lives are, how and what what one thing I really appreciated about this group here is like. This is just a regular couple with their all their issues that are happening and it happens to be the stories of iran and you really connect with them because they it's about a relationship ultimately that you know goes through all of these so i think that was one of the unique aspects of this just introducing the youth of iran and their problems and their issues sorry abe go ahead no, no, no. <laughs> um yeah because I, I i just to to piggyback on what you're saying is 
Yeah, I mean, I really like how how this piece kind of, you know, shows a, a everyday couple and that we did it without like accents, for example, you know, which I'm glad is now becoming more prevalent in, in theater and, mm -hmm. you know, another medium. Um, but yeah, just, just so an American audience can connect with them, you know, because it's very easy when you put on the news and you see that it's always doom and gloom and you know, I mean, I thought maybe we were going to go to war, especially when when Trump bombed, uh, yeah. you know, and killed that general. I was very scared, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> but that's that's a very easy way to dehumanize the, the people of Iran. Right. Mm -hmm. That they're, you know, that they, I don't you know, they don't they don't deal with anything except war. So maybe we should just go and, and start a war there, you know. So yeah, or that um, the government is so uh, violent and corrupt and whatever that people uh, people would welcome uh, right. U.S. interference or invasion, you know. And it's whatever the problems are, it's their problem. Let them, you know, solve it. I mean. From my perspective, for those of us living in the U.S., I feel like our lives um, have been so politicized and we are, our representation of our communities has really been narrowed down to like victim villain representations. Mm -hmm. So in that environment, I think depicting everyday life is the most revolutionary act, you know? <laughs> depicting everyday relationships, human relationships is really the most revolutionary act. So uh, that was my goal and my hope. And I think we did it. <laughs> so. uh, Nahmajan, we only have just a few minutes left in our conversation, which has been so uh, enjoyable. Uh, anything you want to add or uh, something we didn't ask you? Uh, actually, uh, what I forget uh, is to appreciate your great job, all of you. I love the way you um, made my play alive in radio. I can't say on stage. <laughs> so it was so fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And I um, found something new in my play through your performances. So thank you, all of you. Thank you, Toran John. And uh, I, uh, we, I mean, I, I love that, um, that uh, expression of you uh, when you say that uh, uh, showing um, the, the very normal life is now is a normal life in a countries like Iran is very revolutionary act. I love this idea. I agree hundred percent. And I also uh, really like what Abe said that how we are we are being dehumanized and we need to do something against that to, to show how we are human being like other people all over the world. We have theater, we have a cinema, we play music, we uh, are just normal people. <laughs> and I think the mm -hmm. first step is stopping violence against any culture is to show that they are human being, yes. you know? So that is, I think the first step. So I really appreciate your great job and I, uh, wish, uh, I mean, I hope you can continue this way to show um, uh, Iranian normal life with its own challenges and its own, um, I mean, features. And the other thing I would like is that still I am fantasizing a day that you can play, you can perform this play on the stage. I agree with Sam that uh, mm. performing on the stage is something else anyway, full yeah. of energy and full of movement. So I love this radio play and waiting for having you on the stage. Thank you. I Thank plus you. one on that. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, yeah, and uh, we want to thank you for your beautiful play and your amazing work. Um, we would love to see more and more of you and produce more and more of your plays, including the language of wild berries on stage. Uh, to wrap up, I wanna thank everybody that participated in our conversation. I also wanna thank 
uh, Wendy and Chris who are working behind, back behind, I don't know, a digital sphere. Um, and we want to thank HowlRound for uh, live streaming this conversation. Once again, we are Golden Thread Productions. We are the first American theater company focused on the Middle East. Next year, we'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary. We are bringing our digital content programming to everyone for free. If you are able to, please go to our website, goldenthread.org, and make a donation to our company. Thank you so much for joining us and join us in two weeks for another conversation, this time with four playwrights of Arab heritage. Thank you so much and have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you, Nagma John. Thank you, Abe, Sam. Thank you.